Bunny Man. And I'm Crazy Susie. And welcome to In the Night. <laughs> In the Night. In the Eyes of Terror. <laughs> okay. Wow, screwed that one up. Well, it happens. So today we are doing the movie Boo, which isn't very booey. It's not very scary. And this is not the Medea Boo. No, this is another Boo. This is a 2005 Boo. Yeah, this film came out uh, May the 13th of 2005. And this film is the beginning of our 13 nights of October. Or terror, or whatever you want to call it. 13 nights of October. Yeah, so... We're getting into that spirit. Our Thirteen movie trilogy in October. Yes, we are. We're getting to that spirit. The weather is finally cooled down here. Yes, we finally got fall weather, <laughs> and our dog does not want to stay in the house. No, no, not at all. She wants to be outside every second she gets. So, if we need to do anything inside the house, you might as well just forget it. She wants to be outside. So, <laughs> and we don't have a backyard. So. There's the downfall. <laughs> when you live in an apartment and you have a dog that wants to do nothing but go outside, then uh, you're going to be walking a lot. You get your exercise. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, let's get into Boo, the first one. So we watched it on Amazon Prime, and the IMDB score was 4.3 out of 10, which sounds pretty much right. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes didn't have a score, but it had 38% likes, which also sounds about right. It was one hour and 34 minutes long. It was dir the director and writer was Anthony C. Ferrante. If I mess up any of these names, I'm sorry. I am not very good at pronouncing them. There are a ton of actors and actresses in this movie. Could not find... A budget, which irritates me to no end. It seems like they had a pretty decent budget. Yeah, it seems like it's one step above indie and one step below, you know, full, like, Hollywood movie. Producer David E. Allen, co-producer Sherry Bryant, executive producer Heron Cashaw, co-producer Brian Patrick O'Toole, and line producer Dennis Shugashawa. I don't, I don't know. I just don't even know. Uh, they have two people that did the music. Alan Howarth and Carrie James. Cinematography. They have several people that did that. Film editing. One person. I mean, they have a ton of makeup artists, too. They just have a... The list of people is just... Visual arts, sound, stunts, they have a ton of people. So, I would say their budget was pretty good. And we are just going to mention the main actors and actresses. Because the list of actors and actresses is pretty long. It's lengthy. Trish Corin plays Jesse. Rachel Harlan plays Cindy. Jillian Vanover plays Kevin. Happy... Mahaney plays Emmett. I'm not making this up. Shirlene Quigley plays Honey. Algie Hamilton plays Count Pimpula. Like I said, I'm not Pimpula. making this up. Pimpula. It's Dig Count. Wayne plays Arlo Ray Baines and Dynamite Jones, which is like a TV it's a black exploitation. It's a TV show inside the movie that this dude plays. It's Pointless to mention if you ask me, but they mentioned it. M. Stephen Filty plays Jacob. Nicole Rayburn plays Marie. Josh Holt plays Freddie. Michael Samluk plays Alan. Dee Wallace plays Nurse Russell and Jesse's mom. Taylor Hurley plays the ghost girl. Those are the main characters. There's probably a couple more that would fall into the main characters that I didn't mention because honestly, I just got tired of writing them down. Well, basically, this the castle should really just read generic male number one, gem <laughs> generic female number one. You know, but all right. So, let's... but we're gonna get into the details of the plot. Uh, I wanted to read the synopsis, and I will, let me just get to that, and then I'll read it to you. 
And the Luna would decide to crunch on her food as mm. we're doing this. You know, that just that's just the way it goes. What can you do? A handful of college students get trapped in a haunted hospital on Halloween. That's really all they have. It's such a descriptive thing. Wow, haunted hospital, Halloween. Wow, that just... With the original title of Boo. Tells it all. Well, what do you expect from a, a, uh, a movie called Boo? So. <laughs> okay, let's get into it. Yeah. <laughs> I think I gave all the information. A couple of different websites gave it a couple of different times as far as the length of the movie, but, you know, you get that. We get that every time. Well, you usually carry these things. I'm, I'm usually the... You forgot something, guy. Yeah. Or <laughs> make a random joke here. Ha, 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 guy. <laughs> I'm sorry, my dog decided it was dinner time. <laughs> That's better than barking time. Which she was doing earlier, so... <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> I started reading my um, my scary story, and she decided it was time to bark because the neighbors weren't supposed to be out this late. Yeah, she past a certain time, she just gets really irate with anybody's outside. She she's like the uh, neighborhood watch. <laughs> the movie starts out on Halloween with a girl carving a pumpkin, and the phone rings, and you're you're thinking. This is like every other Halloween movie. It, it, no, I mean, even from the feel, like, the cinematography is literally every other Halloween movie you've ever seen. You know, with the, the, she's wearing the, the, the pumpkin shirt. She's wearing the... She's carving a pumpkin. She, she's got she's, a bowl full of pumpkin guts sitting next to her on the counter. You she's know. got ooky goose candy corn. She's got candles. Pretty sure there's a Halloween show on behind her. So, her friend calls to make sure she is still coming with them to the haunted hospital. She hangs up the phone. The doorbell rings. She answers it. It's a trick-or-treater. She knows the little girl that's, that's rang her doorbell. I guess it's one of the little neighborhood kids because she talks. To, she mentions her by name. The little girl asks why she's not dressed up. You know, she says, Jesse, why do you not have a costume on? And she says, well, I'm too old to dress up. And she says, well, why is your dad dressed up? Because she sees somebody behind her and they're dressed up. So she assumes that's her dad. So Jesse closes the door, looks behind her. Nobody's there. She checks the back door. It's wide open. The back door is wide open. She shuts it. And she gets jumped by somebody. They cut her neck very lightly. Come to find out, this is her boyfriend, Kevin. Well, and she flips him, her, flips him over her shoulder and does this whole, like, self-defense thing. I'm like, it's a little late for that. I mean, if someone came up, sliced her throat open, and then you realize you need self, to do self-defense, it's a little late. She goes to stab him with one of the little carving knives that she carved the pumpkin with. You know, those little dinky ones that you buy to keep your kids from cutting their fingers off. What's, What's that going to do? What, safety knives? Yeah. What's that going to do? Uh, nothing. It, it might leave a bruise. That's going to do nothing. So Emmett, one of their friends, goes ahead to the hospital with his dog and turns all the lights on and sets up the hospital with special effects to make them think the hospital is truly haunted. You know, he sets up these gags like he hooks up one of a wheelchair. A wheelchair with a string. So he hooks it up to a door to where when they open the door, the wheelchair moves towards them. So they think, you know, the, the wheelchair Supernatural. Moves. And not only does he think that, not only does he do this, he also thinks he's he's awesome at doing it. He thinks he's like the master <laughs> of, 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 do, of these he's tricks. He's the man of the scares. Yeah. Dig Wayne, who you are introduced to, the cop in the show, is a very corny character. He also plays Dynamite Jones. In the black exploitation fighting Count Pimpula. Yeah. So stupid. I don't even know why they mentioned it. It wasn't even worth it. Uh, it, it there's <sighs> sort of an underlying scene at the end that... 
Yeah, but it wasn't even worth mentioning. Yeah. Is a cop. They show him in a restaurant. He gets free whatever it was he ordered because the waitress loved him in, as Dynamite Jones, which I thought was even more corny, but... It was like some food... It was like it was like a Spanish food truck. It was like... You just got some, like, burritos or a taco or something. I don't know, but I mean... Well, it showed him in the restaurant, and then he left, Well, and... it's not really a restaurant. Like I said, it's a, it's a food truck type thing. She's at the window. He's, at, he's getting it from the window, so it's a food truck. So he goes to get in his car, and they radioed him in asking if he was near the location which he was but he said no he was going home so that's how they introduce you to dynamite the char- the cop character yeah freddie and kevin talk about the girls that are inside the house and call Emmett to make sure he is ready for them to meet him at the hospital and of course it's it's like you're <laughs> I don't know what guys talk about girls talk outside. And it's like this weird banter of, well, she's using me for my car, but I think she likes me type. Yeah. yeah. Freddie's like, well, I think we're getting closer and blah, 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 blah. And Kevin was like, man, she's going to sleep with everybody else except for you. And you don't realize it because Maria is just the kind of girl that sleeps with everybody that moves. But she's not going to sleep with you. No, she's easier spread than, like, peanut butter. So. <laughs> <laughs> stupid. It was a stupid conversation. Yeah, it really was. During the conversation, Emmett gets trapped in an elevator. Who, honestly, honestly, who is going to use an elevator in an abandoned building? And I'm assuming, what, it's 2005, let's say, but 19, well, 1980 was the last, you know, like, Early 90s was the last time that they shut down, like, the last asylum. So, you're looking at maybe, like, a 20-year time period. At least 10. At least 10. And this yeah. thing looked, re- I mean, look, from the light bulb and everything, it looked like almost like 1940, 1950 era. Just the way that everything was. So, you're looking at an extended time frame. Well, if you know that a building has not been used in a long extended period of time, would you even risk getting in an elevator? Honestly, no. I mean... I mean, the look on the dude's dog's face was like, uh, this is a bad idea. Yeah. And he was like, what? What's up, Dutch? Uh, you think this is a bad idea? And he, his dog's like, you're stupid. If the dog had, had a speaking role in this movie, he'd been like, yeah, I think it's stupid. Let's go use the stairs. The dog was smarter than the dude. Yeah. That's pretty sad. So the lights flickered, and he makes it up to the third floor. You eventually find out that that's the only thing the elevator is good for, is taking you up to the third floor. So, he gets out of the elevator. He gets out of the elevator and starts walking down the hallway, trying to figure out, like, what's going on. He thinks it's a big trick that Kevin's playing a trick on him when Kevin's not even there. You know, and he's all, that's funny, Kevin. Do you want to play it that way? Well... I'm the master, so be prepared to pay for that. Yeah. It's the ghost playing tricks on him, and he thinks it's Kevin. Yeah, and then, like, at the same time, there's, like, I guess there was a a light board with all the room numbers, and 333 was lit up Mm -hmm. the entire time, and I'm just... But we never speak of that again. Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) So, instead of going to... Where the cop was asked to go because he was going home. He gets a phone call from Alan, who is the son of one of his former partners. So he meets with Alan because he's in some kind of trouble. He finds out from Alan that his sister had went to that hospital and he hadn't heard from her. She went there with a group of friends or whatever. And he hasn't heard from her. So he wants... Dig to go with him to look for his sister. And he does it in, like, the really crappiest way, too. He's like, come on, man. You know, uh, my dad used to be your former partner. And the guy was like, no, I want to go home. It's not It's not even my jurisdiction. The, the, you know, the department's trying to kick, get me kicked out for anything. I just want to retire. Three more days to retire, man, type thing. <laughs> you know, and he's like, come on. It used to be in your former jurisdiction. You know what it is. You know, and stuff like that. It's like, and he's like. 
Wait, my you you were my dad's partner, man. I, I grew up with you. You're like family. Yeah, and you're in guilt trip from hell. Yeah, yeah. She's my sister. I haven't heard from her for a whole week. Just, Bad things happen there. Come on. Yeah, just that guilt trip and ugh, bothers me in horror movies. And his dog Dutch is smarter than him and refuses to go into the J ward section of the hospital. Emmett finds a very torn up teddy bear and it pans away when the screams start. Yeah, but he goes, oh, funny, ha, 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 funny that you left this here. Like, and then he starts screaming, blood curdling screams. Yeah. So, uh, Dig says that he won't go with him, but he gave him some good advice. He said, the best way to get into the hospital isn't to go directly through the front door. The best way to get into it is to go in through the funeral home across the street. Mm -hmm. If you go into the funeral home across the street, underneath the funeral home in the basement, there's a tunnel that leads from the funeral home into the hospital. So, even though he wasn't willing to go with him into the hospital, he did give him some good but advice about it, how to get in. But into is it. it really good advice? Because not only are you breaking in and entering in one place, but you're breaking and entering into a funeral home, which yes, is in business. Yes, but you're doing it without people knowing that you're doing it because you're going underground. Yeah, okay, but you're still having to break into the funeral home. But how are they going to know that you're breaking in the hospital? Because you're going underground. But you're breaking into a funeral home. My point is you're breaking into a legitimate business compared they to... They were both run down. They were yeah. both abandoned. Oh, okay. So. Okay. All right. So I thought it was like... No, they're both abandoned. See? You weren't paying attention. No. You don't have to because you know I'm going to write down everything. No. Not just that, but I watched it once. <laughs> <laughs> So Alan goes to the funeral home across from the hospital to enter through the underground tunnel. And even though Dick said he wouldn't help him, he follows. He sits out in his car and watches. So Alan finally finds a way into the funeral home. Dick sits outside in his car. Another car pulls up in front of him. Not only does he not have a really noticeable car, like it's yellow. Mm -hmm. But it's like a 1970s like. It's like canary yellow. Yeah, and it's a, it's a muscle car on top of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. so this car pulls up in front of him and out comes Jesse, Marie, Kevin, and Freddie. Oh, your generic names. They stand outside arguing about going in or not. Jesse says a nurse in the window throws down keys. She picks them up and puts them in her purse. Or she sees, I'm sorry, she sees a nurse throws down keys. And she finds them on the ground. Yeah. They finally agree to go inside. Dig watches them enter the hospital. They enter into the main part of the hospital. Everyone stays together. Going into the first hall, a line of lit pumpkins are carved. It reads, Welcome, lined up in the doorway. And along the main wall. They laugh and say, well, Emmett must be working overtime. Freddy runs off. The others yell for him. He jumps out in a clown costume and says, I found costumes. Yeah, funny. Ha uh ha. -huh. Alan finds his way through the tunnel and finds Emmett's dog, Dutch. It was skinned. And was reanimated. It ends up being reanimated. This was a really weird scene for me. You see the dog. It has no skin, no fur, nothing. It's just like muscle and bone. And, and goo. Goop. Looks like somebody like... It looks took, like a whole bunch of slugs. Jello and like smeared all over it. Along with slug goo. Yeah, like slime. And it looks like they, like, swelled up his neck like they were going to, um, I don't know, somebody was trying to stretch inside it. It looks like they were pumping jello <laughs> into it. It's like, <laughs> it's like bloop, 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 you know, Yeah, like, they swelled <laughs> his neck up. And then it started acting like he was going to bark or something, so he just, like, 
shot its head, and its head just went and exploded. Yeah. So, that was that. And then, like, uh, what's her name? The lead female. Is it Jesse or yeah. what? Okay. She's like, all right, did you hear that? And they're, they're in, like, some record um, hallway. And she, they're like, oh, what? It's probably some shutter. It's like, did you see? And it's like, at no point does she turn around and go, did you see a shutter? They're trying to place it off as, you know, something. Oh, it's just, it's not a gun. It's something else. And she's like, no, it's a gun. So, I guess Alan got some of the goo on his face. And he's trying to wipe it off and process what he just saw. And he catches a glimpse of the ghost girl. Yeah. So, I think maybe he thought he was just seeing things, but... Yeah, he was. Yeah, that was all uh, just sleepy. You know, he just needed to go to bed. It was you know, I, I always see possessed skin dogs before I go to bed. So when I know I'm tired, that's what I see. <laughs> so he sees a trail of blood on the floor. So what do you do when you see a trail of blood on the floor? Everybody knows you follow it. Duh. Duh. <laughs> so he follows the trail of blood to the elevator. Once inside, the door closes. And a face is on the door, painted on the door in blood. Yeah, at this time when he's falling in, he should have just gone, herp a derp 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 Just, white people. Yeah. <laughs> the elevator goes up to the third floor, of course. That's the only place it goes. On the wall, a three is painted in blood. And an ID card is stuck in the wall. It has a photo on it, and it says Mira. Then it shoots to a scene of Dig, still outside, sitting in his car. So then the group of four make it to the elevator. And Jessie is only smart one. She refuses to ride the elevator. Oh, come on. It's a perfectly safe elevator. Hey, look. The last time I was checked was like 1960. It should be okay. (laughs) (laughs) So, they take the stairs to go down to the basement. They get to the basement. There's a bunch of hanging heads in the basement. You know, like fake mannequin type heads. Yeah. Uh, On, um... And then they find the whole wheelchair deal that Emmett set up. And it was all connected by a fishing line. Yeah, it was a gag. Jesse and Freddy go back to the first floor because Jesse is over the jokes and wants to go home. Kevin and Marie continue to look for Emmett so they can all leave. Alan is still looking around for his sister on the third floor. Alan looks around in an office and his sister practically leaps on his back. She cuts his hand to make sure it's him. Dig finally comes into the hospital. Alan's sister explains that the elevator only goes to the third floor. Well, to, sort of, you know how I say it was like, it sort of went back and forth, like the whole thing with the, the matches. He had a pack of matches called Dynamite Matches. And he was trying to like do a flip thing he did, you see in the, in the show. And yeah, he used a lot of matches. Yeah. It was trying to tie in the TV show with that. It was just... As you said, he spent like more years doing that than being a cop or something. I don't know. It was just sort of weird. Well, he doesn't do the match thing until the end of the movie. No, but no, he was practicing when he was waiting. Yeah. Jessie has a flashback of her mother while she was in treatment at the hospital and starts freaking out and wants to go home. She starts hearing whistling... So they followed the noise. She follows the noise to a locker room, and she sees a ghost. And Freddie doesn't see the ghost. So did you notice when uh, every time that her mother was, like, sick and they're in the hospital, you see she has a necklace on. Yeah, she has a a, pendant. Yeah, it was like a Celtic knot type pendant. Mm -hmm. Did you notice that sort of like a window, there was the same pendant design in the window? Mm -mm. Yeah, it was... like a shadow of that pennant hmm. in the window. It's like a blended version of it. Mm-mm. Yeah. It doesn't explain anything. I was just saying, I thought, like, it was, I think there was supposed to be something, some sort of weird correlation there. Hmm. No. And hmm. then, yeah. So. 
Kevin and Marie find a dark room and get freaky. They have been keeping each other company in the bedroom for a while now. Sex on a metal table. Yeah, she goes, she, she probably positions him and goes, have you ever had it on a gurney? I'm sitting there going, no, and nor have I ever wanted to. Cold metal, that's only for dead people. <clears throat> cold metal, cold and hard metal. No, well, there's no soft metal. Mm. Metal's all hard. Yeah. Their brace are probably shot on it, too. Dig is still making his way through the hospital. Alan and his sister are through t trying to find a way out and see the girl ghost. Jesse and Freddy talk and get scared because there is a lot of banging noises. They go through to investigate the locker room and find Emmett. Yeah, he's cowering in the corner like the little girl he is. Kevin and Marie go back to the first floor looking for everyone and see someone dressed in a clown costume and the door boarded up. No, and this is where the door was always boarded up, okay? The door was always boarded up. It was protect, you know, like the glass was blown out or whatever. So for protection reasons, they boarded up the glass, the door. But the door itself was not boarded up, okay? Like they just boarded up where the panels of glass would have been. Hmm. And they figured out it was a ghost inside the costume. Like there was no legs. It had no and, legs. And bugs were coming out of the leg holes. and. Well, it didn't really look like bugs. It, like, it sort of looked like melted gummy bear No, it was bugs. like uh, maggots. Yeah, but it was like, but it looked like it was coated in like melted gummy bears. Emmett starts dripping pumpkin seeds and guts. They asked, who are you to Emmett? He says, a little bit of me and a little bit of your friend. He was also shiny. I, he was hit over the head with a metal pipe, and that's when he starts getting all shiny and his face starts sagging. Yeah. Alan and his sister came into the room. Alan has a gun and point, pointed and ready. His sister says, shoot him. The others say no. She says, no, he's our friend. She says, no, he's not. She takes the gun from him and shoots, and it's the world's biggest splat. Yeah. So in this movie, guns make ghosts explode. So who knew the the gun the, the bullets were explosives and effective against ghosts? Everyone is pissed. Marie is covered in blood and freaking out. So they explain uh, the entities here that can take over our bodies. Kevin says, "So one of us could be next." Alan says, I have enough bullets to take you all out if I need to. Kevin takes the gun and shoots the door. Yeah, okay, so when Kevin takes the gun, he's just, he is just freaking out. He's, at this point, he's just scared. He's just, he, he's, he's a big giant wuss. He's, he's trying a to be moron. A, yeah, he's, he's a moron with a gun in panic mode. Three things that should never go together. <laughs> And, and let's just shoot at a random object that has metal parts. I'm thinking that's a bad idea. I saw this in the movies. <laughs> you know, like I expect them to say that. Okay. Alan yells at him, don't waste the bullets. He shoots the door again. The bullet ricochets and bounces off the door and hits him in the shoulder because he's stupid. Does it, does it really, it more grazes him. It, no, it hits him in the shoulder. It shows the... Oh, it I robbed it, inside the shoulder. It just seemed like it grazed him, that's all. He freaks out because Marie is covered in goo and she won't quit screaming. And he thinks she's one of them. So in spite of all of their protest, he shoots her right in the head. Okay, so here brings up a small like mini rant. I really hate guns in horror movies. I, I, think it, I don't think it does anything interesting. I think it's just a cheap ploy. Um, what happened to machetes? Yeah, I mean, I'd rather have sharp... Butcher knives. I'd rather have sharp, pokey things than things that go boom. Just because it just it doesn't add anything to it. It just add, cheapens it, I feel like. So, end of rant. But. He shoots Marie. He turns the gun to Alan. 
Alan tries to take the gun from him. He pulls the trigger, realizes that the gun is empty. Alan jerks the gun out of his hands. If it was me, I would have smacked him right upside the head with that damn gun. I'd have been so mad. I'd have beat, beat him down with that gun. Well, okay, so Marie... I know it's a little bitty dinky pistol, but I would have slapped him stupid with it's that It's still pistol. metal. It's, it's not, yeah, it's still metal. It'll still hurt. I just slapped him stupid with that pistol. And, okay, so he hit, he, he gets a headshot, smack right dab, in the middle of her forehead on Marie. I'm like, okay, I just thought that would be impossible. He can't uh, aim at a big-ass door, but he can, he can aim, aim at, at a head, head yeah. okay? Alan takes the gun and put the re- puts the remaining bullets inside of Marie's corpse. Jesse, Kevin, Freddy, they also take Marie's corpse. They go into the elevator because they wanted to go to the basement to take the tunnel out. Due to the doors and windows being locked, barricaded, we're not sure. It doesn't explain. They're you, they're just not usable. It's ghost locked. Okay. Marie's corpse becomes reanimated. Well, before that, this is sort of a cool thing. They weren't really paying attention to the corpse, and then the blood was... Like dripping upwards into the ceiling, then the elevator sort of like stopped. Lights flickered. Yeah, and then the blood started dripping on them. It was, but it's like that thick motor oil blood. And then the the lights stopped blinking. They weren't covered in blood. Ooh, spooky. Yeah, they got out of the ele- elevator and they were all like, "Get it off!" And there was nothing there. Yeah. Group hallucinations. And so they, so the elevator opens. They get out. Yep. The elevator returns. They realize they are stuck on the third floor. The elevator returns to Alan and Cindy with Marie in an, in a wheelchair, and she is kissed. Well, when you, you somebody just shot you in the head. They close themselves off in a room. Those trapped on the third floor check all the doors to find them all locked. They open the door. Alan opens the door. Marie is no longer, nowhere to be found, and Dig is standing in the hall with his gun drawn. Jesse is seeing flashbacks of patients in the hospital. Dig, Meg, Alan go up to the third floor via the stairs. They go into one of the rooms that is full of body parts and blood. So, okay, I was trying to figure out, like, does she have a chainsaw? I don't know, but supposedly <laughs> this little bitty girl that's Meg hacked her friends that came there with their part, and all you see is this room that's covered in blood and arms and legs and appendages, and she's a little bitty dinky thing. Now, how the heck did she do this? Without a chance, I don't know. Uh, see, here's a lot of the, the issue with this movie. Is you don't that- see any kind of weapons in the room. The only weapons you have that you see in this entire movie are guns. There's no really noticeable kills because it's all cheapened. I mean, there's the biggest... So I sort of want to know how she hacked these people up because I'm like sitting there going, but but do you have a chainsaw? I mean, a butcher knife? Cleaver? A pair of tweezers? What is going on? <laughs> Jesse enters the room. The piano plays obnoxiously and the lid slams shut. She is dressed like a nurse. On the ward caring for patients, giving them meds. She was in the life of the nurse who threw the keys out the window during well, so the fire. I sort of thought that this was pretty cool when um, the, how she realized she was the nurse was that she looked down into the metal, the, the metal trolley that she was pushing the meds in, and then she realized that she was that nurse. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was pretty cool. So Meg got away through a laundry chute. So that is how they were planning on getting away this time. But one of her friends came out of the room where the body parts were, trying to come after them, and Dig shoots her. Okay, so here's another like consistency error thing. So here's all these body parts, right? She hacked up all these body parts. Somehow her friend was a dead body covered up on the gurney. Because you see her pop up like in a split second. But she wasn't hacked up. Yeah, I don't know. As they are coming down the stairs, they see the ghost girl. They very slowly sneak past her and go down two flights of stairs, 
but they are still on the third floor. So they go back in. They find Kevin in the wall. They pull apart at the wall, trying to get him out. Jesse realizes there is a door. Freddy turns into... A squish liquor? A squishier. A, squ a squish liquor. What's a squish liquor? <laughs> a squishier, as he says. So Dig shoot, shot him. Jesse unlocks the door and lets Kevin out. Okay, so Kevin is a, like screaming at this big giant hole in the wall. Yeah, there's a hole in the wall and Kevin is screaming and he's saying, There's something in here! Get me out! But it sort of looks like a big giant glory hole. Just to be... But it's like at head level. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what that's where you want the glory hole. That is, is, is that head. Oh, you, oh, oh, okay. Not his. Not that head. <laughs> <laughs> the ghost girl's body was trapped in the closet where Kevin was. She was set free... When the, when the door was open. Okay, so but prior to the scene, you sort of see in this flashback that she was the the main. She was lured into the closet by the main male ghost. ghost. And so my question is: Is did he molest her in said closet? Because I'm assuming. Well, he was referred to as a child molester by the nurse. And you find out that the body of the girl was in there. That's why he was saying, get me out. Because there was the... Her body was in there. Yeah. Her corpse. Her yeah, skeleton. Her, her skeleton. Yeah, it was her squishy, you know... Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, jelly-covered corpse. Yeah. Okay, now you're to the point to where... They all go down to the basement and into the tunnel... They get into the tunnel and realize the tunnel is blocked with filing cabinets and chairs and office desks and numerous amounts of office furniture. Okay, so I have to admit this sort of the scene because they're they're digging through this all these filing cabinets and stuff. They're digging through. They're trying to get everything so they could get through out. Yeah. Okay, and you notice that the guy's sister. Is sitting there reading or looking through filing cap uh, files, mm -hmm. and you sort of like think that oh maybe we'll finally have some like who are these two ghosts through this you know accidental her finding the files or whatever yeah no there's no satisfaction like that so their plan to escape is they realize that people that are living don't want to die people that have died have a fear of living. So they want to make the ghost afraid of living. Jesse looks in the locker that belonged to the nurse and they look at the file of Jacob, who is the ghost. So this is where they get the file. Mm -hmm. Jesse gets a phone call from her dead mother. She tells her, don't tell me what to do because you're dead. Well, it would have been better off if she goes, Mom, stop telling me what to do like some teen, some angsty teenager. <laughs> Jeez, Mom, I know what I'm doing. She goes into the elevator and basically calls Jacob out. She yells at him, calls him out. You know, I'm here, come and get me. She ends up in a room in a straitjacket, and he's in a doctor's coat. He says she's just like her mother, except for... He tells her, he says, you know, they thought your mother was sick because she had the symptoms. But you have the true diagnoses because you're truly sick, you know, because you see things that really aren't there. And at this point, I think the necklace that she had on bro fell on the ground and broke. Again, I don't really feel like they ever explained what the necklace was or the symbol like, was it some protection from her mother? I don't understand. Yeah, because her, when her mom wore it and they gave her electrotherapy, like, it burnt the image into her mother's skin. Because yeah. during their mother's funeral, she wasn't wearing it. That's when the daughter took it and started wearing it. And you still seen that image of it burnt into her mother's chest. And like I said, it, repeat, it repeated when she had the uh, the visions with her mother with it and the being in the window. Mm -hmm. So all I can think of is that this... Locket had protection 
as like a protective thing for mm-hmm. her. But it's one of those like plot hole things. It's like, okay, here's all this imagery, but you never explain it. And it breaks. And then you're like, oh, well, that sucks. Mm-hmm. But she, maybe it was like, that, maybe that was the last hold of her on the mother. That's why she was having visions of her mother after she you said, mom, leave me alone. And then that's when it broke me. So maybe it was that weird connection thing. I don't, it sort of irritates me. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. He says she's just like her mother and gives her shock therapy. She has flashbacks of her mother in the hospital, then her funeral, always focusing on her pendant. She takes the pendant off and cuts her wrist with it. And that's when you see Jacob, like, have a spaz out moment, like it hurts him or whatever, because she... He was trying to possess her, and she cut her wrist. And Anyway. So it shows her back in the elevator. And she's fine, and he's no longer messing with her or whatever. That got her, got him off her back. She gets back down in the tunnel. She ducks down. Marie's behind her. Dig punches Marie in the face. Alan shoots her in the head. Alan's sister impales her with a chair leg. She grabs a hold to Kevin. Ends up stabbing him with the chair leg too. Because she impales him with it. She ends up like pushing the chair leg up against him. As it's in her. She kisses him with blood a bloody mouth. Which is really gross. But the group finally clears a path through the stuff. To get through the tunnel. Alan puts a hand out to help his sister up and pulls back a handful of goo. She says, sorry, it had to be this way. He gives her the gun and the rest of them proceed to leave. You find out she is the nurse who originally kept Jacob from leaving the hospital. And she shoots both of them at the same time. Basically, she... Gets in front of Jacob and points the gun at her chest and it goes through her and then through him. The others manage to escape and the movie ends with the light of the hospitals turning off. Jacob saying, there will be others. And the nurse says, not on my watch. And then, okay, so this is where the Dynamite Jones thing tries to hook up. He grabs the... A flask because you know everybody has to have a flask in a horror movie somewhere. Yeah, he got the flask from Kevin, and um, when they were going through the whole trying to kill Marie situation, what he does is he splashed the, the booze, the booze at Kevin when he was possessed. Yeah, it was something like holy. He like (laughs) randomly splashed it towards him, not really on him, and then he lit a match and flicked it towards him, which really didn't didn't do anything. He didn't flick. Okay, so when you see that, when you first see him, and he's he's watching the Dynamite Jones character, one of his trick moves, I guess I'm assuming in the in the series, because it's mostly a series, that he flicks a match. And then fl- throws it in the air and round kicks it into the hair of Count Pimpula. Yeah, it's a fro. Yeah. And that works. It actually happens. Well, he flicks this match and it didn't go anywhere yeah, near he, Kevin. He, he does the whole, like, he does the whole flick, ground kick match into nothing. the booze and it just went. It and, did nothing. Nothing and, happened. And then, like, right at the end of the movie, when the nurse goes, not on my watch, she flicks the she flicks the match and lights it, and it burns the spirit of... Jacob. Jacob. Yeah. So, it did catch him on fire. Yeah. So, <laughs> because the whole thing was around that the third floor was a bad floor. J Ward was the bad ward. Yeah. Uh, it was, the, the the like, the crazy. The crazy of the crazies. And no matter what they did... Like, and it caught fire. So that's how Jacob originally died, I'm assuming. And so that ward caught fire, and they tried to, like, rebuild around the third floor. They tried to, they redid it. 
so they put it back into action. But they couldn't redo anything with the third floor. Every time they tried to do something, people would disappear, weird crap would happen, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So what they decided to do was just board off the third floor completely and never speak of it again. But then the elevator got to where it would only go go to the the third third floor. floor. That was it. Mm-hmm. And that's when they were saying that's when they closed down the asylum because it no matter how many floors they put above it or whatever, it would never go to those other floors of the elevator, so they had to shut it down. So, because I think it was all of like 10 floors. So that is boo. What do you rate it? It had potential. I rate it as maybe a 3.5. Ah, we gotta stop doing this. Uh, we don't even talk about our ratings. Yeah, we don't mention how we feel about the movie until now. Until we are ready to rate it. And I also gave it a 3.5. Because of several things. You know, certain things aren't mentioned. Um, I don't like inconsistencies. Yeah, there's a lot of plot holes in this movie. Or... Like I always say, I instead of saying plot holes because I get tired of saying plot holes, that's why we shall never speak of it again. You know, because it just, they'll say something and you're like, I want to know more about it. But then it's like, well, we just mentioned it. They had a good, they had to have had a good budget to do this movie or there wouldn't have been all of the people that they had in this movie that were mentioned in this movie. Okay. So they had all the people. They must have had a decent budget. But this girl supposedly took all these people apart. They had the body parts, but they didn't have a knife. Nothing to show what she had took them apart with. What the hell did she take them apart with? A goddamn stapler? Yeah. A stapler? A a letter opener? Something? I don't know. A piece of paper. (laughs) I don't know. You know? I just don't like those inconsistencies. It aggravates me. Well, and so. like I said, and it doesn't make any sense that they have those limbs, and then this one chick is in, is full, but with a broken leg. You know, and she's... Well, the thing is, there's two, there's three ghosts in the building, and the little girl doesn't typically possess people. Yeah. She likes to show herself. So if Jacob's only possessing one person at a time, then that body's just going to be there until he's... But Ready what I'm trying it. to say, here's the room full of limbs that she supposedly rampaged through and was just wailing on them, and, but she leaves one person whole. She's a little girl. She's a little thing. So she got winded. <laughs> That's what you're telling me. That, that letter opener broke. <laughs> oh, okay. The letter opener got dull. Is that the... <laughs> I don't know, but that's what I'm saying. The inconsistencies bother me. Yeah. And then, um, I feel like, okay, so I don't know if you know this, but in 2005, we started seeing this huge sort of weird flux with, like, uh, Asian horror in movies. Like, we had, like, The Grudge, I think. You know, yeah. like, and that was a big hit. And then, so you started seeing a lot of the, like, a try to a clash between Eastern and Western mythologies within horror films. And I feel like that's what they're trying to do in some parts, but they just did it really poorly. Or they're trying to do Western, and they just did that really poorly. I'm not quite sure, because there was something there. Is like I could sort of see Eastern influences, and, you know, like, grudge-style stuff, because with the mother, usually in, like, Western horror, ghost stories, you don't have something that, if it belongs to you, like a parent or whatever, you don't... There's really not that strong connection of ancestral worship Mm -hmm. you know like the mother like the medallion so why would the medallion hurt the ghost you know if you're looking at from a pure western perspective of ghost stories because that's not really a big thing in our culture you know so the harry potter this one i don't know Mm -hmm. um and again it did never explain that was that was one thing that really irritated me because the imagery was there she obviously used the pennant at one point to hurt the ghost, but it never explains the power of the pendant. Pendant. Pen- the pendant is what you hang up for your uh, oh, okay, okay. team. Pendant. Not a pennant. Pendant. Your pe- the pendant, you know. So that sort of irritated me. It never really explained, like, okay, the mother was sick. We got that. But it didn't seem like she was a very loving mother. 
She was mentally disturbed. Yeah, so... So she was absent because she was in treatment all the time. And, I mean, there was just... But there was just really no consistency with the flashbacks of the mother and the asylum, in my opinion. It just felt like it was two completely different things. It was an afterthought, yeah. Yeah, and... Well, that's just our opinion, but... You know. I did like the setting, though. That was the one... I always like asylum settings, and it looked like it was actually shot in an asylum. So, yeah, I overall, I it's okay. It, there, I don't think there's a rewatchability with this one. Overall, I thought it was pretty good. I think, you know, they could have flushed it out a little bit more, but... And like I said, it. I think it's a one-time watch, though. I don't think it's really a go-out-there-and-get's movie. Yeah, it's probably not something we'll watch again. No. And the only hard part about watching this movie was trying to find any information on it because Bloody Medea. Well, I think that's all for this time, guys. So we're going to do these 13 night things. This is number one. Yep. So we've got 12 more to go. Yep. And we'll have illustrations for each one of them. We'll probably come out with something how to win it either mid through this or something. Win illustrations. The illustrations will come out. You can find them on our Twitter or Instagram and our Facebook. Yep. And so we'll tell you how you can win, where to get them at, what you need to do to get them. We'll scare you later. Yep. Bye.